and I'll never back down In the middle of the ring is where I lay the back down Against all odds, I will always prevail So when you step to me, it's like hell in the cell Greetings and salutations, this is Christopher Daniels. I'm talking to my main man Delzinski right now. Any video game show, any video game channel, any YouTube channel called Vintage Shizzle is indeed hashtag Daniels approved. Yo, alright guys, Delzinski here. It's another We Talk Weekend. And as per usual, I am joined by my partner in crime, Smack Talks. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm still getting over Elimination Chamber um, with Kevin Owens doing the job. Beating Amazing John, stuff. Oh, beating John Cena clean. Could we ever imagine this happening? Nope. It wasn't something I wasn't expecting. I, I am still in utter shock, but I am so happy that this happened. But we're going to be talking about this in full detail today because... We we're talking Elimination Chamber, our views of this pay-per-view. Was it a good one? Was it a bad one? And as well, because it hasn't kind of stopped there, because something else that was kind of awesome and kind of controversial was the Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast. Yes, Austin returned to the WWE Network. And, uh, well, uh, he, he had quite a lot to say, and so did Paul Heyman, his guest. And uh, it really didn't feel like a, a PG interview, let's put it that way. So, tons to talk about in this week's We Talk. And uh, I think we're going to kick it off, obviously, with the Elimination Chamber. Because, what was your first impressions of the pay-per-view once it was said and done? What was your, what was your feelings? Because I'm, I'm going to be honest, because... There's a lot of people out there saying that they like loved this. This was like the best pay per view that WWE have produced in a long time uh, by your WrestleMania. Um, and you know, I'll be honest, I thought it was okay. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I thought it was it was an okay event, but it was like the way the matches was kind of set up. The main event for me was Owens and Owens and Cena. So because that was positioned in the middle, getting that main event. The rest of it, I kind of lost interest and I was a little burned out after that. And it kind of led into an awful match in terms of the Intercontinental match. And then we had the main event, which was something that we kind of all knew how it was going to work out eventually. So that kind of ruined the end of the pay-per-view, like the second half. But the first half I thought was good. We had a great tag team match, the Cena match. And the other bits, it kind of fell away at that point. Well, that's, that's exactly, I mean, my first impressions when I got to uh, finish watching it, because I watched this one live, I know you did as well, Paul, and uh, I kind of sat back and I thought, it was good, but it could have been better. And I think we'll talk about, obviously, the finish of the main event a little bit later. That, for me, didn't necessarily work. But, I mean, overall, I wouldn't have said that there was too many five-star matches in this pay-per-view. I think Kevin Owens and John Cena, obviously... I'm just going to say it right now, I think that was a five-star match, and it had a very good build to it as well. But if we look at the start of the pay-per-view itself, I mean, we had a... Uh, I don't even think you watched this, did you? This uh, this pre-show match, Stardust versus Zack Ryder. I didn't see the pre-show, so I only just actually found out about that. Is, is that because you found out that Zack Ryder was on the card? Well, I, I love Zack Ryder on the card. Like, how, how can he not be on the card? But unfortunately, I was busy with other things and i didn't they didn't actually announce a match for it did they it was just like the daniel bryan thing which i knew was to plug his new book or a dvd Great. so i kind of give that a miss so it wasn't really high on the agenda no i mean that the pre-show was pretty naff um i mean bar renee young that was great but bar renee young and and obviously insane booker t because he was talking some serious rubbish uh on the pre-show like he does i don't think anyone actually knows what booker t is talking about ever Booker T does not even know what he's talking about <laughs> so I mean yeah we had some um, insane Booker commentary but uh, yeah Stardust versus Zack Ryder was just um, I'll just cover it it was just it was it was it was a nothing match there was no reason for it um, Cody Rhodes is just completely lost um, as far as I'm concerned at the moment it doesn't feel like uh, that whole Stardust versus Goldust feud which could have been awesome 
really did anything for him and now he's just stuck as this stardust and we have nowhere to go for him Zack Ryder obviously woo 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 that's as good as it gets well I'm surprised with Ryder he's been on TV like a little bit more he seems to whenever there's like celebrities coming in like we had the cast of Entourage coming on and he always seems to get involved with them so maybe it's like his social media type things how he's like got such a big account and things he always seems to have the right connections with the right people and that's what gets him these matches. Apart from that, he he doesn't really get a look in. The trouble is, is he's not that bad a wrestler, to be honest. I quite like watching his matches, but it's just it, the gimmick just totally is dead. I mean, it was good at the time when he was at that social media buzz, but I think the buzz is well and truly done. And his buddy's not there anymore, is he? So uh, Mr. Punk is no longer there to help him if he helped him at all. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It, it's going nowhere. He's just. There for, he's, he's an extra, basically. He is, he is. So, I mean, that was a bit of a, a naff start. And, um, yeah, I mean, it didn't really matter who won this one because I don't think anyone was that bothered. But, obviously, Stardust beat Zack Ryder. So, I'd say it wasn't the greatest of starts for a pre-show. Obviously, as well, you mentioned Daniel Bryan. Again, um, The Miz is back. But um, I kind of got this wrong when I was complaining about this on Raw. For me to complain about something, I mean, it's unheard of. But I Was this of... your Delzinski fact about The Miz losing to Sandow? Yeah. I, I, I kind of got stuck in my head that this happened. I don't know how you confused that. That was, that was so obvious. Like, well, Obviously, Sandow changed his whole like Miz Dow gimmick. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes these things happen. Hmm. <laughs> mm. Well, it, it was it was late at night. I'll give you that. I mean, yeah, I was obviously uh, very very tired about this, but anyway, it was it, it was like you say, just to promote his book, and that's not exactly very great. I mean, all that was really really established for this pre-show was that Daniel Bryan has not retired. Yeah, well, well, basically, it was just what we said the other week. Like we knew he was going to come back to promote this. But really, you want to just stop calling them up, just leave them at home and just let them have the time to recover. That, that's all he needs. Just stop bringing them back for all these stuff. You can still plug the book, put a trail out for it. They've got, a, they've got a really good show actually on the network where it's like a preview for the DVD. So I caught that and it had like Brian's first match as American Dragon in the WWE. And that was really cool to watch. So stuff like that, that promotes it just as well. You don't really need them there. And I don't know, I think it's a bit of a waste to keep bringing them back when you could be at home recuperating. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't. I think it, it's less is more with Daniel Bryan. We don't really want to see him at all until he's till he's better fit and comes back because it will make his his return um, ever so much greater if he does just come back with a bang. Um, keep bringing him back on TV. We just can't really forget. You know, I, I don't want to sound out of order here, but you can't really forget the two problems that he's had since he came back with injuries so he, he's becoming that guy where it's just like oh man he's just injury prone and he keeps coming on tv just to be reminded that he's around but i don't think any of this is necessary we just need to get him away get him recovered and then he comes back and he comes back with a hell of a bang you know he comes back at a time when we least expect it no wwe uh promotional tool needs to go into this it just needs to come back and shock uh the universe and that would be good yeah, totally. I totally agree with that. So, I mean, yeah, the the pre-show it was it was bare. It wasn't it wasn't anything special. So, I'm not going to say that I thought it was horrendous or bad or anything like that. I just think it didn't really establish anything for the WWE. So, with that out the way, then we obviously had the first match of the evening. It was a pretty big one, to be honest, because we had the Elimination Chamber Tag Team Match uh, for the Tag Team Titles and. For me, this was one of the matches I was looking forward to because, number one, I was looking very much forward to seeing how it was all going to play out with two guys in a pod. Uh, that sounds kind of strange, <laughs> but there you go. Bigger pods. I, yeah, well, and then obviously we found out that it wasn't just going to be two guys in a pod, but we're also going to have maybe, you know, um, um, El Dorito, El Torito, whatever, in the pod. Doritos? Doritos, yeah, El Doritos, Doritos, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we're going to see him on top of the pod uh, then we're going to see Xavier Woods in the pod and then for some reason they forgot to put Natalia in any of the pods yeah I was wondering why she didn't get a look in that was, that was a bit odd just leaving arrows so uh, 
for me, um, obviously I was very excited about this match to begin with because I thought it was a very different concept and it was going to be awesome. I liked a lot of the spots um, because there was a lot. There was a lot of spots. I wasn't too keen on having um, the special guests in the pod in in terms of El Torito and um, uh, Xavier Woods. I kind of liked Xavier being involved, but what I would have liked um, from my point of view, the way they should have done it, is that somehow Xavier got into the chamber or worked his way of getting into the chamber and then making a nuisance of himself. Then El Torito could have got in the chamber. I would have rather seen that than have them already locked in the pod because it was like having this sort of bizarre handicap match in a tag team match. It just didn't make a lot of sense for having some teams with two, like Kid and Cesaro and the primetime players. And then you had, you know, obviously uh, Los Matadores or Los Matadores. We still haven't kind of worked that out yet. But at them with El Torito, it just... Uh, it wasn't a proper tag team match in the end. It wasn't. It was kind of awkward in that sense. It makes you wonder why, like, the primetime players and people weren't like, oh, you, you doing anything backstage? Do you want to come be our mascot? Yeah, where's, just where's, join, in the, join in the gym, man. You can help out if need be. When It's no DQ, so it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. But I kind of like the fact that Torito was in there because, like, he hit a few good moves. Like, he did. When he, when he first, like, the Matadors come out and you hit the crossbody, or was Hurricane Rana or something on Cesaro, that looked really cool. And then when he climbed it, like jumping off there with like the splash as well, I thought that looked awesome. Where Kalisto's, I thought, kind of looked aw- a little awkward. And every time I seen him, he was climbing something. It was like he thought he was in like a TNA Steel Asylum match. <laughs> and he was like trying to get out the top. And then the way that they had to kind of wait and look up from when he did fall. And it, it didn't look great. It was like, oh, he's, he's going to fall now. We've, we've got to make sure we're ready. And. I don't know, it, it just didn't look right. But at the same time, I loved all the spots in it. I thought it was like really well done. I thought it was a great match. And I, going forward, I would love to see some more tag team matches like this. And maybe we're not going to get it, but I would love to see like a tag team money in the bank where they can like, keep the gimmick matches in, just make use of all these tag teams and build on what they're doing. Yeah, it kind of felt a bit like Kalisto uh, had just been taken to the park the first time and found the climbing frame and just decided yeah. to just constantly climb. The thing I thought about the Kalisto bit, and I, I want to ask you this, Paul, that bit with the pod where he kept getting pulled down by New, New Day, uh, that didn't really um, amount to really anything because we thought he was going to jump and obviously Sin Cara did his jump and it looked really good. And I thought what maybe would have been better, and it was a spot that was missed, was having Sin Cara and Kalisto jump off the pods at the same time. But in- yeah. instead, it, it, I mean, I think in the end he got suplexed off the top of it or something like that by Cesaro. But it just it, it looked awkward. And it even looked awkward, you know, when he actually climbed to the very top and then he t- tried to do that swing. It was almost mm. like no one was ready for him every time he tried to do it. It, it was. It was really awkward because that was one match I watched back earlier. And... The bit where you're on about where Sin Cara actually hit the, I think, was it a cent on that hit off the chamber? Was that it in the end? Did he hit. did he actually hit something in the end? I, I think, well, Sin Cara did, but then he oh, had yes. Kalisto on the other side. And I think it was Victor that was down on the floor next to him. And he kind of rolled in the corner and he was sitting in the corner, so he wasn't ready for it. And I was thinking, well, hang on, surely like Kalisto was going to do something. Now he's been up there for like half an hour. <laughs> and it just got to the point where they grabbed his leg again and he couldn't get out. And it was like the majority of the match, that that was all it was. And I get maybe like that's a good strategy to hold him there because then it like makes it 2v1. So like someone else has like got the potential to be eliminated. So it's it's a good strategy, but it didn't make a lot of sense. It was like... Did did the miss a spot here? Did they not time it right, or did yeah. he not feel confident enough, like actually hitting it from there? Like something seemed as though it was going on. There's something that was missed. Yeah, so it just didn't feel right at that time. So it, it felt like that they'd missed something, forgot something, and it just wasn't going to plan. But um, yeah, I enjoyed all the spots that happened in the match. But I think that was for me something that was kind of awkward, and it was easily noticeable. It wasn't like fixed or anything and something that was kind of really interesting about this match was the ascension because um for weeks now jbl and the wwe because i'll mention jbl because he just has he's been on an onslaught to bury the ascension but the ascension looked pretty good in this match up until the point where i decided to tweet that they looked pretty good in this match and then um they got (laughs) eliminated so you just tainted it i mean the uh, 
this was a great chance when they I thought what they were doing was they were finally going to give the Ascension a bit of a, a bit of a run at this and you know the way the Ascension were going over they were dominant and I didn't expect Sin Cara and Kalisto to go out so soon so I was thinking wow but then immediately it was almost as such that they were like oh no no now's your time to go get out um I didn't like that I thought they should have definitely um if they're going to push the Ascension to eliminate the other tag teams just like that then why not just go a bit further with them guys? Well, I think what I said was like, I was surprised the Ascension weren't out first, mm. but then like someone says, yeah, but Los Matadors are in this match. I was like, that, that's a fair point. So obviously they're going out first. I would have expected the, the Ascension to then be out second. So it was surprising to see the Lucha Dragons go out then. But I think it's it's done well for the Ascension because it the They've probably got more pinfalls in that one match than they have over the last couple of months. <laughs> so it's good for them just to get them back on track a little. I'd and really, then I'd, we, had, we had Cesaro and Kid, who I don't think they pinned anyone, but because they're like such a good team and they're already on a roll, we also had the primetime players who come in and I think they got two pinfalls. So for them being like the first match back and returning, that, that was good to see them actually get a couple of pinfalls in there. So I think it's worked out well for... Most of the teams in there, bar Lost Matadors and the Lucha Dragons. Yeah, I, I was kind of shocked to see uh, Kid and Cesaro go. I was like, oh no, you know, because I, I just love watching Kid and Cesaro. Um, but I think that they're definitely getting high on the primetime players. And I was surprised that they didn't actually take the belts in a way. I kind of thought that possibly it, it felt like the momentum was going more towards the primetime players. But then um, obviously, you know, New Day came up with... Uh, uh, with another way of managing to get the way through. So it's, in a way, I think that the Chamber did a good job in establishing quite a lot of tag teams and making it look like we have got quite a large tag team division. But um, I, I just felt that most of the spots weren't weren't as good as what they could have been, to be honest. I thought, I thought it felt a bit awkward at times. So that was my only criticism of the Chamber match. But it was definitely better than the one that we saw later on in the evening, which we'll get to later. Yeah, I... I... Well, I don't know. I, I still kind of say I like the spots in it. Like, the, in regards to like Kid and Cesaro, even though like they got eliminated, I think it was good the way they done it because Kid had actually pinned. Um, I can't remember who it was, but he, he pinned someone else at the same time. So it was like the referee counted the roll up on Cesaro, and that was how they got eliminated. They didn't count the pin what Kid had. So I think that was a good way to kind of save them a little bit and. Really, the, the were kind of screwed over a little way, but then at the same time, I think the prime time players they looked really good. I think Titus O'Neil like had a really dominant sort of section in that match. It was, it was really cool the bit where he was like with his head stuck through the chains as well, oh, yeah. not just beating away on him. And then like you come back from that, and you, like he's, he's someone that is like really talented. He's got like a lot of like ability and things, and he pulls off some really good moves. But I think it was just a case of the new day is so over at the minute. It would be like by the time to take the titles away from them. I was I was actually thinking, was he actually going to get his head out of that cage, to be honest, out of, <laughs> out of that chamber, to be honest. I was a bit worried about that. But he did. He came out and he was hoorah, hoorah again. So, you know, it's all fine. But um, I completely agree. I, I thought Cesaro, again, um, just to touch on Cesaro, was another outstanding performance from him. The drop kick. Do you remember the drop kick? The, the drop kick was amazing. Like, the, the height that he got on that for, like, the size of him. Like, I was absolutely yes. amazed by that. There was, like... I think it was to Kalisto on top of the chamber. He like hit a running uppercut as well. Mm-hmm. Where he like springboarded up. I thought that was really good. And it's it's like we're so used to seeing it now. It's like it's amazing to see, but we don't talk about it as much because we all know how good he is. It's the strong style. It's like it's so amazing to watch Cesaro at work. That that whole um that whole running European uppercut thing back and forth is just wow. Um, do you know I'd really like to see a feud for Cesaro. Who's I, that? I want to see Sheamus versus Cesaro. That's what I want to see. I did we not see that last year? We, we we probably did, but I would like to see it again because I tell you what, Cesaro's um, move set. I know he's still doing like you know your standard like European uppercut, but he's kind of stepped it up in terms of the way that he does those moves. Because recently, the way that I look at it with him is he's put a lot more flair into that stuff. So you know, as opposed to just doing one European uppercut, it's like a flurry. It's like five or six. Yeah. You know. And and then you've got Sheamus, who's just his ultimate badass. Um, you know, just I'm so high on Sheamus at the moment; it's just untrue. I mean, they're just getting higher and higher and higher, <laughs> and you say, you know. But 
I just think that that would be fantastic at some point. Um, but I, we're probably not going to get it because he's in a tag team. I, I, I'm still a proper pro that Cesaro should be higher up in the company than he is right now. He should be, but I'm kind of torn because I like so much what he's doing in the tag team. I think if you put him singles, there's so many people, he kind of gets lost in the crowd. Yeah. Where the moves that he's pulling off with Kid, like the tag team stuff, they've got so many tag moves and finishers and things like that. It's, it's really cool to see. And like one that I really liked was they went for like a Dudley death drop. Oh, where yeah. it was like the flapjack into the oh my gosh, and I thought that was really cool. So like it, it's all these moves that they're pulling off. It's like a new one all the time, and because they're so innovative, that's why I just absolutely love watching them. Well, that's it, and I don't want Kid to get lost either, to be honest. So I think that obviously the longer they stay together, I like the fact as well that they finally got their attires almost matching as well. They had like almost <laughs> almost a bit like the Heart Foundation look. It took them a while, isn't it? So that was cool as well. So yeah. Um, I I've, I've, I've personally had a mixed reaction with that chamber match. I thought there were elements of good, and then there was a few bits where I was just—I wasn't—it wasn't bad. I just thought, oh, that didn't look quite right. But then again, obviously, it's a test, wasn't it? It was the first time we've ever seen a tag team elimination chamber match, so they'll learn from that, I think. Because I, I do expect we'll probably see it again at some point. Yeah, I think it's been a big success. So I think going forward, it's something that we'll see definitely in the next one that comes up. So, moving on to a match that I'm sure you were very excited about, Paul, was uh, Nikki Bella versus Paige versus Naomi for the Divas Championship. And um, I believe it was, uh, I, I don't know when you reminded me of this. Did you remind me on We Talk about Nikki Bella? And uh, Was this about the title reign? Yes. The length of it? Yes. Yeah, it kind of ruined it, didn't it, when I brought that up because you knew it was going to happen? Yes. Because yeah. it doesn't really feel quite like uh, there's any plan to remove that title from her because they just want to stick that big finger up at CM Punk and AJ Lee just a little bit more. And we'll get onto him as well on the podcast because, again, it felt like they were doing some more damage to, to Punk. Um, yeah, so so obviously she retained. Are we that bothered? And... Um, Shouldn't this have been Naomi's moment? It should have been. It, like, There's been a few points where it should have been Naomi's moment, but they, they just don't seem to be committing with her. I don't see why they've brought her through like all of this change and things, and now they're not willing to actually give her the belt. Because, yes, we've got Paige in there, and like Paige is like, over with the crowd so much, so you can see why they could give the belt to uh, Paige. But I think when you've spent so much time building up Naomi, then... To actually get the payoff from that, you have to give her the belt. And for some reason, they just don't seem to want to go ahead with that. Well, I think the thing is, is that Naomi hasn't had the opportunity like Paige has. Paige is cemented now. I don't think Paige has got that look as well. She's obviously that, she's got that pasty look about her, pasty Paige. Uh, but she's got the look that, you know, everyone knows who Paige is. Um, everyone knows that she's a big talent. Um, when the other girls come up from NXT, it's only going to make her better, I personally feel, because I think that she's maybe had to tone herself down to compete with the girls that she's on the roster with at the moment. Someone like Naomi is really good, actually. She's a good, she's a good athlete. She's the sort of one that can compete with Paige. So it would be ideal at this point in time, and during this match, it would have been perfect to give her the belt and probably ignite a bit of a feud with Paige for a bit, let Nikki step back a bit. But as you say, you know, you mentioned it, the long title reign that she's had... Um, they're just going for it. They're going for the juggler. They want they want um, her to have that, and um, I don't really see the point of it. To be honest, I don't. I think it's a bit of a dig towards AJ. I'm sure she's probably thinking, really already, you're going to surpass it, you know. And um, I don't know. No, no discredit to Nikki. I I, I think she's a very good wrestler, but. Um, I don't like it. I don't like that. I think it was a good opportunity to get the belt on somebody fresh and, and give a bit of a, give a diva a chance. Why not? Why not? It's, Why it's not? just, it's like, can you think of much that she's done that's memorable in this reign when you compare it to like AJ's reign? Because AJ beat so many people and like there was a huge list. Then there was even like the payoff at the end at WrestleMania with, pretty much the entire division going up against her and she's still like come out on top can you remember anything memorable about Nikki's reign she kind of looked hot for quite a lot of it well there you go 
that, I'm sure that, I'm not sure that's going to be this thing that they sort of come back on about how memorable that title reign was because there's nothing else that you can actually like bring up, is there? Well, I mean, if you if you just said you know what was memorable about her title reign and they just went, well, that was hot. I mean, that sums it up, yeah. But I fearless, mean, wasn't it? It was fit. Oh God, don't get me started on that. But I mean, uh, yeah, I I I get what you're saying. I think probably the most memorable bit of her whole title reign. Actually, this was this even around. Well, it's just sort of the 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 patheticness relationship with her sister. To be honest, that's what her title reign has become. No one's understood the the pairing of them since they had issues. And then uh, all of a sudden, do you know what? Actually, I, we've not really talked about the match. So let's talk about the match a bit because the match was quite good. I, I thought there was quite some good spots. Her page took a really nasty bump, but um, I mean the match was quite good. And then uh, it kind of. The finish? What do you think of the finish? I, I thought it was a weak finish. Like the the move where you see a page took a nasty mom bump. Was that the? I think it, was, it was like a reverse hurricane runner type thing. Yeah, Naomi. Because I, I thought that looked devastating. I thought like that might be the point where Naomi, Naomi pins page. But I, I don't know. Like the fact that it was just ended in like the same way we've all seen with a rack attack, and the fact that Nikki was the person pinning Naomi, like. Maybe if she'd pinned Paige, then it saved Naomi a little bit. But I thought it was kind of weak that they had her be the one that took the pinfall. Is Nikki not becoming the John Cena of the women's division? I, th- I think she's already there. I think that's the case. Does this mean that I am going to have to make rant videos about her in addition to John Cena? Really? I, I think it's looking that way, isn't it? <sighs> I mean, I... I, I just think it was time. There was a, there was an opportunity here to establish someone else as a as a major a major character in the Divas division, and it was perfect. Um, but it just seems like they've obviously sided with they need to get her over this period of the the title reign, and that you know outweighed the option to give a new champion. I can't see other any other reason why they wouldn't do it. I think I don't think Paige needs the title. That's the thing. Paige is just there, and everybody loves Paige in terms of. In and out of the ring. I think a lot of people mm-hmm. like her character, her personality. I mean, she, she social media's a lot. Um, she's definitely in the UK. Everyone's a big fan of her. So, um, whereas Nikki and Brie, um, Brie's just a different, a different puzzle in herself. I mean, is she a wrestler? Is she a manager? Um, maybe she's just a, a stunt double. Um, <laughs> cause she a leader uh, went, well, yeah, come on, the key. I mean, I mean, just the roll up, uh, from raw, was it raw with page? It was the switcheroo, it's, the switcheroo. We see twin magic. I mean, yeah, it's like, well, that's something else that I was going to like point out as well. And they're the now back to being heels again. Uh, they're, they're chopping and changing more in the big show at the moment. Well, they're taking like acting lessons from them and it's just change after change, isn't it? I I just, a lot of people say, well, because uh, I think I've had a conversation a bit with other people about the Divas, and um, they they all seem to sway more towards Brie, that they, and I think Nikki is the better of the two. Well, I still prefer Brie, but because of this title reign, they're not going to take it off her, so she's going to be stuck with this. But to, going back to Raw, though, I, I don't get how they pulled off Twin Magic, because they don't look anything alike now, and it wasn't like she like tried to hide it after the pinfall either. She didn't get straight out of the ring. She was just lying there, and then Nikki had to climb in. No, no, no. She it was had like a, she had a streak of blonde in her hair. It, it's, it's how <laughs> blind is that ref? Oh, which one was it? Was it was it the WWE Two K Fifteen one, the screw ref, or was it the uh, the other ref who's got those insane face reactions? Which one? Was um, it? I can't remember. I don't know which one it was. I mean, it doesn't really matter. How can you? I mean, yeah, you and plus, actually, oh, do you have to, we have to check this? We have to check this. Were they wearing um, Bella One, Bella Two? <laughs> I, I think they were in both two, but like oh. Breeze attire was different. It wasn't. It didn't have everything that Nikki's had. So it was like you could tell it was different, and they don't look the same. So how are they still pulling off twin magic? I don't know. And I mean, what? Why? Why is as well? I've got a question for you. Is is why on earth? At the moment, have they become like heelish again? What's the what's the reasoning for it to become heels? This is the problem with these two. There's never any reason behind anything that they do. It's because Paige is a face. That's why. 
There's no other explanation for it. Like, it's pointless asking me because I just haven't got an answer for it. The switch between it depends on who the opponent is. And that's what seems to book whether the heel or face. And why isn't Nikki number one? Because she's the better of the two. But in your opinion, but as you just said, a lot of people swing towards Brie. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this. I don't know if you've seen this, Paul, but I'll, I'm going to leave a link to this in the description because I just think it's hilarious. Have you ever seen uh, The Lonely Island before? Um, I don't think so. Well, I'm going to enlighten you and I'm going to enlighten the wee talkers. I'm going to leave a link in the description box below to a video about um, The Lonely Island and uh, guy number one and guy number two. It's like the Bellas. So I'm just going to do that for you because it's hilarious. So go check it out. But anyway, back to these two. Um, <laughs> I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't really understand them because uh, for a long time, I think if you cast your minds all the way back to the, uh, to the, orig- uh, to the original time when we questioned this, uh, we were saying we don't understand their, their sort of direction. But they are becoming like monsters in themselves in terms of the way that they're being promoted. They are on par with Cena. I mean, WWE are pushing these girls uh, to, the, to high hell. So we've just got to deal with it. We've got to just put up with it and, and hope this doesn't damage girls like Sasha Banks, Charlotte, who all come up. Yeah, totally. It's just like, I don't have a problem with them having a lengthy reign, but make it memorable. Make it a reason why they've got that reign. Don't just do it for the sake of it. There's got to be something behind it. They've got to be like pushing for something. It, it just gets boring when you say like person after person having a long reign. It's more exciting when you say the title actually changing hands. And I think the issue is as well, there are girls there that could create an amazing few, but they just haven't managed to come up with something good yet. So um, even even a few with Paige isn't, isn't all that. So, you know, mm. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it was it was predictable that after we um, covered or, or Paul um, un- unveiled the whole uh, championship reign, it was obvious that Nikki was going over. So, yeah, disappointing because I kind of hoped that Naomi would get through that match. Anyway, let's pick it up a bit. Let's let's talk about something that was not disappointing in the slightest. It was probably the biggest shock to hit the WWE in a long time and um, uh, literally a KO to John Cena and it was fantastic. Kevin Owens defeating Daniel Bryan. I mean, holy crap. Um, I think it's been a long time. I probably... Did you just say defeating Daniel Bryan? I might have said that. Did I say that? Holy I'm pretty shit. sure you just said that. Holy shit. If I said that, that's weird. John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that bit out, yeah? Leave that bit in. Oh. It just shows your knowledge, shows how like focused oh, you are on what's happening. I was too busy thinking about Bella number one and Bella number two. See, that's where you're going wrong. Ah. <sighs> Anyway, get with it, Dell. Ah, uh, I am. I'm back. I'm back in the game. Kevin Owens. I've even got it on the screen. It even says <laughs> the match. Um, Kevin Owens, John Cena, like best match ever. I mean, I thought it did, couldn't get any better from Brock Lesnar. That was the most exciting I've ever been to see the sheer dominance of the beast. But this, this was like, uh, I just can't believe it happened. I still can't believe it happened. Uh, Kevin Owens is by far the most amazing um, up-and-coming talent that WWE have got. And whoever is helping him move up that ladder is doing a phenomenal job. I've got a feeling it's Triple H. Thumbs up to you, my friend. Yeah, it's it's got to be behind this. Triple H has got to be the guy behind it because I don't think he would have got this opportunity under Vince. And it, it's like because Triple H knows what he can do and he's seen what he can do in NXT. But even aside from that, he showed so much more than what we've seen in NXT. There was moves that he was pulling off in this match that I haven't seen him do. And actually seeing Cena take them as well, it, it was crazy to see. Like, I think Cena went for like um, a superplex and he turned it into more of a brain buster. Yeah. So that was awesome. I had the tease for the package panel driver that I actually thought he was going to do. And then he switched it and it went into like a package power bomb. So there was so many good things. Like even stealing, like he he stole Cena's catchphrases in the run up to this. And then stealing these moves in the match as well. I thought that was really cool. So he went for the You Can't See Me, got that counted in the STF. But then he actually hits him with the AA. And that was like a really cool thing to do. And just the whole way he's been booked, not just this match, but the promos, everything. I think it's all been done so, so well. And 
even though they announced the rematch so quickly, I, I can't wait for it. I have a problem with them like announcing that so quickly because we are only saying that he knew how to end the fight and then getting on the mic at the end of it and saying he'd ended it. It was like, well, he's just ended it. Now you've got a rematch. So it's, it's not really over, is it? So I would have preferred them to string that out for another week or so and just don't say that, you know, I've already beat you, John. Like, I've proved myself to you. I've nothing else to do. I've ended the fight. So that didn't make too much sense. But I can't argue. I, I'm looking forward to the rematch. I think it's going to be another match of the year candidate. Well, I think what this definitely did this match was cement Kevin Owens is if you didn't know who Kevin Owens was, if you're like a, a PG guy and you, you never bothered to go and do your research on Kevin Owens, well, you know who Kevin Owens is now because like you say, the moves that he did in that match were amazing. Obviously, he teased the package pile driver, which I was just like, holy crap, he's going for the package pile driver. He's going to do it, he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Uh, but he didn't do it. But um, and, and then it was sent on bomb. I mean, um, he, I, he did a, some sort of somersault as well. I just uh, For a big guy, he is just exceptional. And, um, you know, I think emotionally, the reason why this match was so awesome, and you've got to give credit to Cena for this, is... Nobody wanted Cena to win, but everybody expected Cena to win. And that was the difference maker that when he hit that other pop-up power bomb, it was like, he's going to kick out of that. He will kick out of that. It's only two. He'll kick. And that's, that's the feeling that you get with John Cena is, you know, I even tweeted, I was like, holy crap, how on earth does this guy keep kicking out? And, and the thing was that Owens hit him with the kitchen sink. He hit him with everything. I was like, this is going to, if, if, if Kevin Owens does not win this match, this is going to devalue Kevin Owens so much because he's thrown every move at John Cena and, and John Cena's kicking out too. And then John Cena is going to win this and that is going to kill Kevin Owens in terms of the whole, you know, that he's, he's I mean, he, he would have been spent because he would have done all his moves. But, to give him that victory, it was just tremendous. The reaction, the whole crowd loved it. Um, credit to Cena for letting it go that way, I think, as well. But I, you know, I was so invested in this match. This match was brilliant. Storytelling, everything about it. Seeing new moves from Owen. Seeing Cena, Cena stepped it up. Um, I mean, I think Cena, And it was fantastic, the whole you can't see me. That was, that was a treat. It's, that is why you'd love WWE. And when they do get it right in certain matches like this, um, you know, it comes off awesome. I will say, though, you know, um, like you say about the rematch, my issue with that as well is why would Kevin Owens want to give him a rematch? He's beating him. I mean, should should, should possibly would have been nice to have seen Kevin Owens then reject the rematch on Raw and say, I need to fight you. I've beaten you. I've been if you know, I've been wrestling like 15 years, been here longer than, you know, doing things better than you, Cena, you know. I don't need to fight you again. Why does he need to fight him again? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like he doesn't need to fight him again, but because this next pay per view is only two weeks away, got to build. They, they can't delay it, and they know like how well this has gone. Then, as soon as they can get that promotion out there and say, "Look, we're going to set this match up again," you're going to get the chance to say a rematch. Then they're just going to push it straight out there. There's no like holding back or anything. As long as they can like get it out there and sell some more uh, pay per views and get more people on the network, then they're going to go for it. My biggest concern is that um, the minute it was announced was, oh, no, Cena's got to get his win. You know, that's what I was like. I was like, I don't, I don't, I, do you know what the best thing that they could do is let Owens win 2 and 0? I think that would definitely be like the best thing to do, especially if he wins 2 and 0 and then he's like, I'm not giving you that rematch at that point. Like, that'll be really cool. And I think he cut this promo at the end of it when he said, like, when he first come through and he says, like, some people might not know who I am, but they all know who he is now. And I think that the the kind of fans, like, we mentioned this previously about the people that weren't watching, like, Ring of Honor and maybe didn't watch NXT, they would see Owens for the first time, saying, like, he's a big guy and think, you know, he's not going to be that impressive in terms of the moves that he can pull off. But then this was his, like, showcase match, and he's pulling off things like the scent on bomb and... It was it was like a moon it was it was moon salt that he hit, but he was like facing the wrong way, so he sort of jumped up the top rope, turned around, then hit a moon salt. And it's like, how can he be that size and be so agile and able to pull off them kind of moves? It's just amazing to see. 
Well, when you see someone do that and then you, you refer it to like a, a springboard stunner that never looks any good. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it just it just says it all. I, I, I thought it was fantastic. I think Owen's, you know, give him praise. Give Cena praise as well for, for making the match look as good as what it did because both men definitely did a job. Um, the segment on Raw, I thought, again, just, just to touch on Raw, um, the segment on Raw really emphasised how good Owen's is in terms of mic skills, he came out and he just, I thought, you just nailed it again. I mean, every, his stock is rising week by week. He came out and he cut this promo and he was so in the moment. It was just so good. I mean, it's just his, his facial reactions, the way he doesn't give a shit about what the fans think, you know. And then he's talking about his kid and he's like, you know, he's got to break the news to his kid and stuff. He's being John Cena. It was, just, it was just awesome the way he scripted it and planned it. It was perfect. And then later on in the evening, Triple H, I think, bumps into uh, Ambrose and Reigns and says, how about that Kevin Owens, hey? It's like, you know, Triple H is loving every second of this. It's And Owens is just becoming the machine. It's like when Brock Lesnar's not there, well, it don't matter because you've got Kevin Owens here and that's a match I want to see. But, um, you know, Cena then obviously cut his own promo back. Um, I'm not sure I like the whole ins and outs of that promo, but I think it definitely showed a difference in the way that Kevin Owens does things and maybe the way that Triple H thinks to the way that Vince does things in terms of the way that John Cena likes to do his promos. I think definitely showed a difference in the styles of what we're talking about now. So that divides coming a little bit. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Like in regards to Cena's promo, like Owens, Owens was so good in talking about his kid and things. If you watch the video on YouTube where it was like following Owens up to that day mm -hmm. and then also showed him afterwards and he was talking about, oh, I kind of wait to like call my kid and speak to him about it and see what he thought. So then that gives you some more like perspective of what he said on Raw about speaking to his kid and then his kid asking about John Cena as opposed to him. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as good as that was, the Cena one, it was like that's John Cena's Cena. promo, a cut there where it has to be... Uh, regular John Cena promo where you know what he's going to say and all the Cena haters just get on the back of it and just start chanting like Cena sucks but then he brings up like his whole never give up thing and he points out like the kid in the crowd with the I'm beating cancer sign and it's like well you can't get back you can't argue with that it's like you're supposed to be cutting a promo where we're going to hate you but like that just shows like how nice a guy he is and you kind of argue with that side of him so it's kind of hard because that was like such a heartwarming moment actually mm. seeing that and the kid in such tears and I think after the show you also like brought that kid in the ring so like you give them that like really cool moment so you kind of argue with that side of Cena but in regards to this feud I think it's hard to bring in that side and actually get that heat behind him. That's the trouble you can't <laughs> you know that's the that's the problem there are those nice those things with Cena that you just respect and obviously that moment was something that you respect it's the other element of the promo which we all thought oh no because it was about questioning his passion he's here every week we've heard this so many times before you could name it with Lesnar you could name it with Rock you could go back to any opponent he's had it's always about questioning John Cena's passion Kevin Owens hasn't questioned his passion throughout this he's just come out and said he doesn't really you know he thinks that he's the future and the future is now it's simple as <laughs> yes the future is now he's the he is the next big thing and I, i'm really excited to see where this goes and what i really liked about cena's promo was the fact that he says that owens is the guy that sort of epitomizes cena's whole message of never give up because it's taken him so long to get here and he's had his doubters like jim Cornette and his trainer and the voice says that you're not going to make it and yet he's never give up and now 10, 15 years later he's finally here and he's getting what kind of oddly they say is his first match in the WWE yeah. which it is on the main roster but it kind of bugs me the fact that he's been in XT. Yeah. So like I like the fact that he brought up that and he says like you epitomise the whole message never give up and you've proved that by never giving up you can achieve your dreams. I was expecting, um, because I, I honestly never thought that Owens would win this clean, I was expecting possibly a, uh, a Samoa Joe rocking up maybe to maybe cost him something because they haven't really developed um, a, a huge amount of time at the moment with the Samoa Joe feud. So when I, I thought that something like that could come into play, but obviously it didn't. And it was just, it was, well, it was fantastic. It was, it was, the, it was the match of the night and uh, I'd say it was a five-star match. Yeah, I would say definite 
five star match and candidate for match of the year. Yep, totally. And the build going forward to this is good. It's getting better and better. So awesome stuff. Um, let's move on. And I know you mentioned earlier about it being the chamber match, I think, but I think we had a little a little other match in between it, but the crowd just really just just couldn't get into this because of, they were still overwhelmed by the amazing presence of Kevin Owens. But I think it was Neville against Bo Dallas. It was. And like, that was the whole thing running out throughout the night. Like, if, if you're on social media, you'll see like a lot of people are tweeting about the crowd because the crowd was like really poor, I thought. Like, there was a lot of times where even when someone won a match, they cut the crowd to get the reaction. And like, the, People didn't even stand up. They were just sitting down. It was like there was no reaction there whatsoever. And it was so quiet compared to like some of the other crowds. So I think that kind of took away from it. And especially after that match, which, like like I said to me, was main event, you were kind of on sort of a come down from that. So straight afterwards, it's like, if, if you think back to the Undertaker's matches at WrestleMania with like Triple H, Shawn Michaels, then... Everyone sort of looked forward to that match, and then some of the main events that followed those matches, then you you'd kind of already seen like the big thing, and you weren't as into that. And that's kind of how I felt in regards to this match, and then the matches that followed it, because it was it wasn't as like high profile and things as what I'd just seen. So I never really got into it. And the Neville and Bo Dallas thing, it's it's not really like a big thing anyway. It was just more of a sort of filler in between that and leading on to the other matches. So. I wasn't too invested in how it went. It was good to see Neville win. I think that's the right decision. But I think I think that was the reason why I wasn't really invested in it. Yeah, it was it was a lot like the streak when the streak got ended. I mean, you, you, I know it was still a uh, it was still a big night, but it really just just deflated. That deflated the crowd. Whereas this time round with Kevin Owens, um, that was more like the crowd just was still on a bit of a come down or still it was it was shock it's just it's just like the streak it, you're shocked at something that's happened either if you're excited or happy about it or whether you're not you're shocked so the crowd is still recovering from that and then you know Neville and Bo Dallas come out and people are still talking about the Owens match you know they're just sitting there going can you believe that Kevin Owens won so these matches afterwards felt like that they really just got lost because you still couldn't believe it so I mean, yeah, Neville Bo Dallas. Um, obviously, Neville d- just needed a victory because he's, you know, he's he's been on this like he's had this great run, but he's just, you know, he hasn't really picked up too many victories along the way. So it was nice to see him actually beat Bo Dallas. Bo Dallas uh, needs to just be repackaged, in my point of view. He's, um, I can't believe in that. <laughs> you don't believe? No, he, uh, uh, the white tights um, put some put some design on them please just he's had a shave as well so maybe he's not going in the white family after all i know i mean i the thing actually some some person in the crowd it might have actually been on raw actually shouted out you're the worst of the wire or something like that <laughs> something trying to trying to just take the piss but i mean yeah i mean he probably thinking that repackage me or do something with me because i'm not not getting anywhere at the moment with this uh, maybe even send him back down to nxt just 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 give him something give him give, give him a bone you know give bow a bone just give him something to get his teeth into because he's not he's not getting it on the main roster yeah i totally agree give him a ball and <laughs> <laughs> uh nice cheap plug there nice nice one like that like that a lot uh so yeah that match was a bit of a nothing match um good to see neville get a victory but i think that's really all you can say about it and then I mean, we move into the, um, oh man, I don't want to sound negative, but th- there are negatives of this pay-per-view. So I, I struggled to say this was an amazing pay-per-view like some other people told me, some other fellow YouTubers told me, but yeah, I'm not buying that. But anyway, uh, the, 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 the Intercontinental Championship Elimination Chamber match. Now, I don't know about you, Paul, but uh, when we reviewed this last week, we forgot the big guy, but the big guy seemed to be the guy that everybody wanted to win. Is this true? N- not as far as I'm aware. Like, I-, I don't get the thing with Ryback. Like, he-, he seems to be someone that they're trying to push, but it's like against what people want to see. At, at least for me, it's like that Roman Reigns situation again. Except Roman Reigns is a lot more likable than Ryback, in my opinion. But and the other thing about the match, what was a disappointment? Oh no, was Mark Henry? <laughs> <him in? laughs> I knew he was going to say that. I mean, 
Oh, I think we were all expecting Bray, and that would have made perfect sense because he could have... I know I, I said I didn't want him in the chamber because I thought it would just devalue him because he's not going to win. But yeah, man, yeah, get Bray in there because he can obviously feud with Ryback because that's a current feud. And then they bring out the the, the world's strongest Santa. So... And, well, that would have been like a good thing, wouldn't it? With like this... The Bray Wyatt and Ryback thing seems to have just ended, which is exactly how a Bray Wyatt feud ends. And it would have been good to actually prolong it and maybe get something like going. But why they brought back Mark Henry, I, I don't see why. Because he's turning into a, a beast, isn't he? You know, he did come out and he was annoyed at Roman as well. So, But if, if, he, <laughs> if he'd been brought back as a beast, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But he wasn't. And I think that is my sort of issue with it. It was it was naff. It was naff. It was a, it was an underwhelming moment uh, to see him come back. You could have. I would have liked him to have like maybe reached out to Jericho or something like that. Just got someone good in there. But yeah, Bray. Um, but yeah, Mark Henry was a huge disappointment. And then I mean. Ryback winning. Uh, what, what I was trying to get out with this Ryback thing is there's quite a lot of people out there that were like, oh, Ryback definitely deserves this. He, no one else more deserving than Ryback. I'm still not on that level with Ryback. Well, I don't think I ever have. Like, when he, when he first come through, the Goldberg stuff and that, it kind of really hurt him. And to me, I just, I'd never recovered from that. I don't think he's great in the ring. And, well... What CM Punk said about him sort of um, injuring people on that, when he is actually injuring people, like, you, you can't really argue with that. It's like, why, why is he still getting a chance when that's happening? And he's not great in the ring. I, I don't think he's great on the mic either. So I, I really don't get it. It's, it's like lots of people have superstars that they connect with and others won't. And maybe that's just the thing. Maybe it's just the kind of wrestlers that I like. He doesn't fit that mold where other people will like him. And I respect that opinion. But to me, he's just someone that I don't really connect with. And that's why I kind of get lost in his matches. But overall, I thought the Chamber match, it was just a really sloppy match. And it just didn't really work too well. Yeah, I know it didn't. It didn't. And I think, just to touch finally on Ryback, I, I think the trouble is, is with Ryback is your punk did do damage him a lot with those comments. But if I was Ryback, I would have probably taken those comments and utilised them and said, yeah, I, I injure people because I'm a badass. I'm going to, you know, do some damage. And then when people are getting sidelined, do what any good, I know he's a face at the moment, but do what people would do. Take credit and say you put them on a the shelf. Try and put a spin on it. I don't really feel there's any sort of spin with Ryback. It's like, oh, now it's just he's this face, but not, he's not going to bring credibility to the Intercontinental Championship. Let's put it that way. Anyway. I think that's my main issue with it. Like, it's it's all been about building these belts up. This has been like a match that was the second main event, and something that the whole event to begin with was sort of promoted around. So, in terms of the participants, there was only really Sheamus that I could say actually winning it and yes. bringing something to the belt. But maybe like now the thought is the saving them for money in the bank, and that's why they've put this on Ryback. But then that is, if Sheamus wins Money in the Bank, surely he has to cash in and win the championship or so. Uh, that's, 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 a, that's what we talk for next week, man, about that whole alignment of who's in the Money in the Bank match. Kofi Kingston, uh, yeah, spot fest. Um, yeah, he's in there for like some crazy spot fest, and that's the entire reason he's not going to win it. So, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, I, I hands down wanted Sheamus to win this because I actually think that on paper, if you were going to give um, anyone the belt, you couldn't give it to Barrett again because he's had it too many times. Ziggler, the same reason. Mark Henry, what the fuck? And then, uh, obviously, uh, our truth <laughs> we never had a shout in the first place. And then, obviously, Ryback, for me, just didn't work. So, Sheamus was the one. And Sheamus, for me, is the one to actually give credibility to the belt whilst Daniel Bryan's away because Sheamus is the monster heel, the awesome heel that he has become. So I really wanted Sheamus to win this. Uh, obviously, he didn't. That was disappointing. But the chamber was a mess. I mean, we saw the bit with the pod. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, mishaps do happen. But the bit with Mark Henry with the pod was just ridiculous. Sh shall I go in? Shall I go out? Shall I go in? I mean, <laughs> just come out of the pod. It was like, well, he's not allowed in the match because he's not been let out the pod properly. It's like... What? What? Well, th that that was one of the things that made it awkward, and then the Sheamus thing. <laughs> what, did he did he actually lock himself in there, or was that not planned? Or he he did he he did 
actually what they tried to explain was that he used his his lovely Celtic cross, lovely Celtic cross to to lock the the chamber. And then he wasn't, he wasn't, or to lock his pod, and he then he wouldn't be able to get out. And, and the referees couldn't understand why they couldn't open the pod. Uh, the wrestlers in the ring were just looking at him and going, He can't get out the pod. Do you know, do you know what someone could have done if you wanted to get him out the pod? Just run into the bloody pod. Ryback could have done that. And well, that's him out the of it. thing. They break pretty easy, don't they? You could have broad kicked it. And you said it. You, you. T- I think you tweeted it. Why is Sheamus? Uh, uh, but then it was an act, so they managed to get around this. But you know when Sheamus was doing that reaction thing of, yeah, oh like- my god, you know, it was it was obviously like you. Uh, I'll let you tell 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 the we talkers what you said. Well, it was just a case of why are you complaining? Like you're in the pod because you kind of get eliminated. So it made no sense whatsoever. But I think my main issue with it was the fact that the people in the ring, it was if they didn't know that he was locking himself in the pod because they all seemed sort of puzzled. They were standing around sort of wondering what was happening. And that was something that just killed the pace of the match and again made it a lot more awkward. I think we all just thought, is this some sort of botch again? Because obviously we saw Mark Henry botch it. So then yeah. we thought, is this another botch? And it, that's, that's, that's what it was. It was it was just a messy, messy match. It just didn't feel like it had a lot. Um, I personally think if Rusev was in this match, he would have won the Intercontinental Championship. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that was definitely the plan. Ryback's just been, well, plan B. Well, he's going to be fed to Rusev when he comes back. You would think so. So and and what I loved about um, just to quickly mention Rusev um, was um, the the rather rather touching promo on Raw where he said it was heartfelt, wasn't it? I know. I felt so sorry for the guy. He's, he's lost his woman. He's lost his belt. He's lost his leg. Sort of, you know, just whatever. He's lost everything. And then, uh, but he's gonna come back and get it all back. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. We're watching it, and it's like, oh, it's Rusev, man, cheer up. Embrace the power of positivity. Where's the new day? Get them in here. Stop clapping. <laughs> it's like, it was really cool to see that side of him, but I, I just couldn't stop laughing when I was watching it. I told you, week on week, Rusev's facial reactions is the best bit of Raw. you just got to watch Rusev's face every single time. It's either shock. Uh, actually, to be honest, Seth Rollins did give him a run for his money at Elimination Chamber. Uh, that, that was oh. hilarious. Though. Did you see the Photoshop of Edge? Uh, uh, yes, I did. I did. Um <laughs> That was so well done. So, I mean, uh, it was hilarious. But, um, I mean, yeah, it wasn't the nicest or smartest of matches. And uh, what I will say is anyone that thinks, oh, you're just hating on this match. The reason why I've complained about this Elimination Chamber match is look at the Elimination Chamber, I think, from Survivor Series with Shawn Michaels, I believe that was in it, Chris Jericho and co. Um, That's an amazing Elimination Chamber match. So when you look back at something like that and you compare it to this, then you you know I'm giving you an understanding of why I'm so critical of that that chamber. And I think probably Paul, you probably think the same. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it, we've seen this in the past though as well. I'm sure there's been like championship matches where we had people like Kingston and Chris Masters and people like that in there, and it kind of had the same feel where you had that lesser sort of superstars in there. So I don't know, maybe you sort of knew you weren't really expecting too much, and that's kind of how it turned out. But at least with Ryback winning, he was the person that injured Rusev, so maybe that'll set them up for something when they actually come back. Going to be fed to Rusev. Yep. Feed him more. Feed him more. Feed him more. Uh, So, I mean, moving into the final match of the evening, um, we were right. Seth Rollins retained, but he didn't leave with his belt. So... um, I mean, this was this was the match again. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. After Kevin Owens, um, I was I was kind of I was still recovering. I was kind of thinking, you know, the last two matches have, you know, Neville Bo Dallas was was okay. Uh, this Chamber match wasn't all that. I was quite exhausted at this point. And and we'd seen Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins before. Uh, obviously, we had J and J, Kane out there. Oh no, not all this again. I was kind of feeling like, oh, no, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all of this. Um, and then. Boom! The shock factor came in with <laughs> Seth Rollins actually losing to Dean Ambrose, as it seemed, and we crowned a new champion. And I thought, "Holy crap! Did they just do that?" And at that point, the crowd loved it. I loved it. I think the whole of social media loved it. And then they did the the the, the unthinkable. Yeah, it, it was a bad decision, wasn't it? 
it was like it for us it was like something like 10 to 4 in the morning so not only were we sort of deflated from the c and Owens match and sort of more interested about tweeting about Owens and things yeah. than watching this all of a sudden we all woke up and I think the crowd in attendance they all jumped to their feet and woke up as well and it was such a cool moment. It was like, did that really just happen? Because when you see them come down, generally, whenever something like that happens and they hit a finisher and another ref runs down, they'll always kick out on the two. And you're sitting there watching the thing and you, this is where he's going to kick out. Holy crap, he didn't kick out. Ambrose has actually won this. And it was for that brief moment, it was absolutely incredible. But then pulling the actual switch on it and saying, no, no, we can't have that. One's pulled the ref in front and that's the reason for the DQ. It's like, wait, you've just kind of got we're back and excited and into this pay-per-view. Why take it away? Why not just end the pay-per-view there and then have that explanation on Raw and say that Rollins is still the champion for that reason? Just send everyone home happy. That's what they've kind of done wrong, in my opinion. I think the trouble was as well, it was such a terrible DQ. I mean, it was just, it was rubbish. It was, it wasn't even worth it. It was just not, I just thought, no, you know, it was like, I just thought, oh, really? You've, you've gone and chose that to be the reason why? Um, that bloody 2K15 referee again. It was, he just gets in the way. gets in the way all the time. He ruins Saturday Night Main Event whenever we're recording it. It's walking in the way on Irish whip people. Oh, just get out of the ring. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, he was in the mix once again and spoiling it for everybody. But overall, I mean, I think my criticism of this match is that the match was fine, really. Um, it was just, I was still recovering from other things. It was fine. And then obviously they gave us the moment that we all wanted. And I think for the network, it would have been a huge thing to see a title change hands on the network. Then the next night it'd be fixed. Like you said, perfect. People go subscribe to the network then to actually, you know, uh, to be honest, if you find out that the title changed hands on the network, you would have gone and subscribed to it straight away. And then they could have played the switcheroo uh, on the next night or even just maybe switched it a week after. Either yeah. way, he could have got that belt back, but not on the night because yeah, just leave everyone with a sour taste. Some people said that was great storytelling. I don't agree with that. Yeah, that, that's how I would have done it. If I was booked now, I would say send them home happy, let them think Ambrose is the, title, the champion and then just switch the title back the following night. Yep. And it, it's a great way to then say, look, look what can happen if you subscribe to the network. You never know what's going to happen. So make sure you've got that subscription in place so you're not missing out. And actually, when I went on Facebook after the event, they had the clip of like Ambrose with the title and photos of him holding the title. And it was like teasing people, like, go get the network because Ambrose is your new champion. And I just think it would have worked so much better if they'd sent all home thinking that and then made the switch at a later date. Yeah, and they could have come up with maybe a bit better, a bit of a better idea of the, the reason why the, the title couldn't be changed you know they could have maybe done something a bit better it just felt again it was like oh you know they just they couldn't give the moment on the night and it always is like that with wwe they never uh, they can't savor the moment at the moment i think that's the trouble so yeah that was that was a bit that i was kind of disappointed with so i mean overall pay-per-view um I, I thought it was okay, but there were for me there were more negatives than there were positives. I think Owens was a huge positive, and uh, the chamber matches well one of them was good and one of them was meh. Um, and the main event I was so excited to see Dean Ambrose become champion, but then to only have my bubble burst that made me think I'm not happy about this pay per view. Yeah, that I think that is the main thing. I think the whole time frame between Owens winning. And then kind of being like so stuck in that moment of how good it was and talking about it, then kind of looked over the following matches and then getting back into it with Ambrose win and having that taken away, that that was kind of what killed it. So maybe it, it was a better pay-per-view than we think. It was just the order of the matches. That's maybe what kind of hammered it a little bit. Yeah, I'd say that. I think... Um... And they could have easily put Owens and Cena at the end because they've done that before in events where it's not been the championship on the line. So um, maybe just WWE and undersight from them. But then again, they all, they obviously want the championship to, to be important. So can see where they put it at the end. So difficult one, difficult one. But um, I, I, was, I was satisfied with elements and not satisfied with others. But then again, you know, at least we've got some good feuds coming out of this. Rollins and Ambrose will continue to rattle on um, Kevin Owens Cena is just amazing 
Um, and obviously we've got a new Intercontinental Champion, so who knows what's going on. And obviously New Day just providing positivity left, right and centre. So Totally. And when you think there's only been two weeks to build to it, then they haven't done too bad a job. They haven't, uh, but there is a question about how many pay-per-views they're trying to get to because they're not getting enough time to build a lot at all. So it's it's rush, 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 you know? It is, but if, if we get some matches that deliver, then I don't really have too much of a problem with it. I think it'll be interesting to see how they go into the next one because we've only got another week now until Money in the Bank. Money in the Bank's going to be awesome. Well, everyone looks forward to the Money in the Bank match anyway, so like regardless of the build, it's something that we're all going to be looking forward to. And we've also got a second ladder match because I think Ambrose and Rollins is now a ladder match. Oh, yeah. Yep. Who have they, uh, in that, um, in that uh, ladder match, the Money in the Bank one, who... Who is in it? So we've got Seamus. I think we've got Orton. We've uh, got Reigns after winning three matches on Raw. Oh, no. Seamus isn't going to win this, man. But <sighs> that was another problem with Raw. It was like, I don't want to see three matches with Reigns when you've got so many superstars on the roster that I would rather see. I'm sulking now. So, yeah, I don't think Seamus is going to win it. I think it's made for Reigns at this point. Seamus is the best. Sorry to break in here. <laughs> um, I don't know why I'm so high on Seamus. It's amazing how, like, uh, you know, uh, someone turning heel just changes your complexion of them completely. But um, anyway, let's get on to something else. I mean, to kind of, I don't really think it is to cool down, we talk. It's kind of to heat up because the Austin podcast, which went on after Monday Night Raw, but with Paul Heyman, I mean, um, we're going to talk about this just for a little bit, but um, first of all, the whole, the podcast originally, when it started, um, I actually wanted to watch this on the network, but I couldn't quite get the network to function. I was absolutely knackered anyway. So um, I watched it the next day. And um, the first thing I noticed before I get into the bad bits, the good bits was Austin was so jacked. Austin was ready to do this podcast. It felt like it was the biggest podcast of his life because he was so up for this one with Paul Heyman. Um, I just felt that intensity before it even got going, and that was why it made it kind of feel awesome. It felt like Austin had taken on board the criticism that people had given him before, and it also felt like Austin was maybe giving a bit of a here's to you to the WWE as well from, you know, kind of nixing things of, of what he was going to do for the WWE. So I felt like him being brought back was an opportunity for him to really raise hell. And I, I personally think he did on this podcast. Yeah, he did. I thought like after everything that's been said and like apparently both parties um, kind of being at ends with each other because of some of the questions that's been asked. I thought when he come back, he's maybe going to tone it down a little and he's not going to push things as far. But he went completely the opposite way. It was like he come in there, he's like, you know what? People saying Jericho's not answering, asking the right questions. I'm going to ask the damn questions. So he just threw all them questions there and they got some really awkward things that... Later, we found out what cut out, and I didn't actually see some of the things that they mentioned. But it was like you went the complete opposite way. And if they were going to have problems before, I'm sure they're probably having problems at this point. I think it was um, Man Three Sixteen. He just pissed his pants um, for, for ninety percent. It was, of that wasn't show. it? Yeah, it was like Austin. Austin just didn't really hold back. And and, and to be honest, that's what we kind of want to see. Um, I'm very happy with the way Jericho does his podcast. I've said that before. But Austin went in and he had the perfect partner to do that with because Paul Heyman's not going to mince his words. So Heyman was just like, just giving it back. And, you know, well, what did we, touch, what did we touch on? We touched on we touched on things like, for example, um, you know, Heyman being a Jew. Uh, do you really think Vince is going to be thinking, oh, this is a topic we want to talk about? No, of course, of course not. Um, you know, and then it, it, talking about road trips, um, you know, with people, superstars, you know, hanging out of cars and uh, pranks being played on people and, um, you know, just so many scenarios where I was thinking, Vince ain't going to like this. Vince ain't going to like that. And, and, and even at points, they were almost taking digs at Vince. It was like, hey, Vince. It's like, you know, so it was almost like they were having a jab at him. So this was not the PG WWE that we all expected. And it was good because it was on the network. But because I watched this the next day. Do you want to know what became disappointing to me to find out? Go for it. They edited it. Yeah. They freaking well, edited it. The thing I couldn't believe about that is when I watched it, I watched it on the network. So I, I was busy doing other things. So I had it on the background. I wasn't watching the video. So I just had the audio where I couldn't really tell it had been edited, even though they did sort of like just end certain conversations. But 
I finished watching it and I, I was like, well, that, that's some of them things that they brought up. Like, I'm surprised they haven't edited them out. So then surprised, finding out that they did edit it was kind of surprising. Yeah, and I mean, like, we're not just talking about, like, uh, the things that they were bringing up. It was, this was not editing out things that were controversial to a degree because Heyman was talking about controversial things and they left some of those bits in. They actually edited out bits that people would have been interested in but because it was related to a person that possibly Vince doesn't really get on with anymore, the WWE are not on good terms with, they cut a lot of this stuff. That's not what I pay $9.99 for. And I'm not saying that $9.99 is a lot, but just don't do that. I mean, we wanted an... Un- what is Austin's podcast? It's Unleashed. Well, that's what I was going to say. Was it edited on the Austin podcast on Podcast One? Because he did say it was available on there as well. I have to check that because obviously I've only seen it on the network and I hope it was, it's not. And I would imagine Austin would probably be quite firm that he wouldn't want that edited. So it would be interesting to check that out. But, I mean, for me, my biggest problem with it was it was, it was interesting to hear Heyman's aspect on Punk. But I only got to hear probably five or maybe three of eight minutes worth of that because they cut it. Um Rick Rude, for me, I, I'm still, maybe I need cluing up on this. I'm not entirely sure. I, obviously, I know that he did the switcheroo back in the WCW days, and if Vince still hates WCW, even though it's not even a company anymore, then, you know, poor Sting. Hello, Sting. Where are you? Where are you, my friend? Come back to the WWE and do some more work. But, you know, if, if you know, they've still got this hang-up issue with WCW, then Rick Rude has been seemingly chopped to the wayside, and it's completely ridiculous because he should be a Hall of Famer. And uh, hearing about stuff with Rick Rude, I was really looking forward to hear with, obviously, Austin being with him in the Dangerous Alliance, and they freaking cut half of the stories out of that as well. Just, uh, 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 no more ranting. Wait. Well, it, it's kind of hard because I don't know what they cut out, but I would love to see, like, hear more about the punk stuff. Yeah. And there was a point where, like, he asked him about the so-called infamous um, plane ride, like, with oh, Vince and Heyman. Yeah. And now that I know that it's edited, like, I'm wondering, was there more of that than what I've actually heard? And with Heyman saying in the interview, you know, I'm on the best terms with Vince that I have been for years and years. It's like, after this podcast, really? Are you sure that's going to be the case going forward? It was it, it it was it was it was a, a really intriguing listen. Um, it's just disappointed that they did edit. I need to still hear the full uncensored version. But I think with with me with things like Rick Rude and stuff, it wasn't required for WWE to take that on the network because uh, you know this this should have been a podcast that was just open and free. Otherwise, what's the point of getting these guys on? And I think that's Austin's logic anyway. So he wanted to fire those questions and Heyman's perfect for the job. But um, the, the, obviously, um, this podcast went on and obviously we, we found out a lot of things. Uh, you know, it was interesting to hear about Punk, um, you know, for what I've heard. <laughs> um, obviously, the story about Vince, and they did talk about that relationship of when Heyman was running SmackDown. But then towards the end... Um, podcast began to go a bit sour because it became around Heyman. The way it kind of went down was Heyman. They talked about Lesnar earlier in the show and, they, and Austin had said he wanted to go hunting with him and all sorts of stuff like that. And that's when stuff came out about the Jew and all sorts of stuff like that. But, but anyway, towards the end of the podcast, um, Heyman just goes, I want to start asking you some questions. You know, I want to talk to you um, about some things, Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he, he then he fired at him, you know, when are you going to get in the ring at WrestleMania 32 and face my beast, Brock Lesnar? And then Austin just went full, you know, full promo on it. It was like, you know, I, I'm not going to um, mince my words here. I'm, I'm, I I don't want to have a match with uh, Brock Lesnar anytime, um, but I would have a Texas death match or something like that. I'm not going to stand there and, you know, wrestle him. And then, and then it was like, Heyman then got out his phone and Heyman was being disrespectful to Austin. That's the way we're trying to sell it. And then, and then Austin's like, look, I don't care who you're talking to. I'm talking to you man to man now. And it was like, is this for real? Or is this a shoot? Or, it, and it's happened on the network. And, and, but, ah. That is the thing, though. It's it's like when I when I first started watching it and he asked that question, I thought, oh, this this is going to be worked into it. So like, it's teasing that match for WrestleMania to see how people react and then whether or not they go ahead with it. But as it got on, I was like, well, hang on a second. Is is Austin actually annoyed at this point? Because he's really going for it. He's not holding back, and he actually looks quite frustrated at this point. So 
I don't know, maybe there's like something behind that. Maybe there were plans for him to come back in Texas because I kind of believe they wouldn't have asked him if he'd be interested in something. Maybe it's kind of fell through. And maybe him and bringing it up is something that kind of gets to Austin knowing that maybe something was in the works and it's been dropped. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But I think now that you've teased it, like, why not go ahead with it? Well, it was Austin's body language was just so um, abrupt. And like, even at the end of the show, it was like he couldn't be bothered to sign off. He was like, you know, uh, he, he didn't want to. And then Heyman was like, you know, shall I just get up and go? Shall I walk away? Yeah. And it was like, what? And it, it's like, uh, you were enjoying the podcast up until I mentioned Brock. And it was like, it was, like, it was just weird. Um, so, I mean, um, I'm going to kind of give you the other aspect is that it is a complete and utter work and they're testing the water for WrestleMania 32 because I was saying to Paul before we come on, you know, they need to sell seats um, at this Texas stadium. It's, it's, it's humongous. It's like 100,000, isn't it? It'll be around that, yeah. So mm. they've, got to, they've got to sell. And what's the best way to sell in Texas? Austin on the card. So um, I think they are trying to see and they've done this a couple of times haven't they they've tried it with uh, rock triple h um so it doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to happen but um i've got to think that texas um austin lesnar um add maybe sting to the hall of fame and undertaker that will sell out that stadium so people tease rock brock um i i don't know what i'd rather see to be honest with you but i'll i'll, I'll give it you that would generate a buzz and that would be amazing to see Austin come back. I don't know what condition he's in. I think he looks pretty good shape, but it's his knees and his neck, which are the issue. But, um, I think it's a hundred percent work. I think so. I think there's been a lot of rumors about it being rock and Brock at WrestleMania, but being in Texas, there's no bigger name you could get than Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I think everyone still wants him to come back for that one more match. So if you do get that, I think that'll be absolutely amazing, especially in that place at that time. And we have had him teased before because we've had quite a lot of teasers with the Austin and Punk stuff. But if we can actually get him to come back for one more match, and it is against Brock Lesnar, main event at WrestleMania, especially if it's for the title, that, that would be absolutely incredible. And that'll definitely get people buying tickets. Yeah, it's, 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 definitely, it's definitely something that would just sell out the stadium because... Um, for for someone like me, if I could go, I would love to go to see that. I mean, imagine just seeing Austin. The here in the glass smash comes out, raise hell one more time. It's that nostalgia for for these for the sort of fans that we are, and then obviously for people in Texas, Broken Skull Ranch, all that sort of stuff. Wait, it's your hometown boy as well, isn't it? Yeah, done deal, done deal. So teasing it could happen, and and do you know what? Just imagine this: Austin, Brock, Triple H, Rock. It would be incredible, that. that if, if that was up, I think I'd be buying tickets as soon as they come on sale. So, you know, uh, guys, let us know by the comment section below what you think if that was on the card. Would would that sell it for you? to feel Sting that Taker. Oh, Sting Taker. I mean, it's just... It's a dream card when you look at that, isn't it? And then, and then throw like you know, you, you obviously you, you 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 guys like Seth Rollins. Oh, what about what about a, a triple triple threat between the Shield finally happening, like a proper one? Well, there you go. We're booking WrestleMania, and it sounds amazing at this point. So, yeah, uh, guys, let us know your <laughs> WrestleMania predictions in the in the in the section, comment section below. But holy crap, sounding good already. Oh, we always just want to go to Texas now. We'll just get on the plane ready. Just make sure we're in first in the queue. Exactly. I'm going to try that. I'll, I'll get there. I'll stay there, and then I can just do any sort of YouTube from Texas. But surely, if the WWE are getting these reactions, then they must be thinking, well. These are the matches that people want to see. Why aren't we putting these on? Well, there you go. I mean, um, I think they're testing the water, but they don't want to overdo it because obviously, otherwise their young talent's going to get the hump. So I think they've got to balance it carefully. But that's the thing. I think if we get one, it's going to be one or the other. So it'll either be Triple H and Rock or Austin and Brock. And I'm hoping we get Sting Taker because I feel so sorry for Sting at this current moment in time. I, I think so, but... Again, I don't know, I think if that was to take place, I think it'd be an Undertaker victory, which then means two losses for staying two years in a row. I think you might have a double, uh, I think you might have a no contest if you had that match. That that would be good, but I think at the end of the day, it's still a cheap win. Yeah. So, 
So, I mean, oh, it's so interesting. I mean, I'd like to see maybe Sting come back at SummerSlam, but that's probably if we talk for another time. <laughs> I, I hope he does. I hope he comes back and he gets that victory. He needs one. He needs one win. Um, so I hope WWE aren't going to be dicks and screw him over, but there you go. But, um, yeah, I mean, that kind of brings us to the end. So I really want to get the We Talkers view on everything. I mean, from Elimination Chamber to the Austin podcast, I mean, <laughs> Austin Brock holy crap that could be awesome um any sort of shameless plugs this week well um Ooh. i might say keep an eye out for a wwe trailer next week oh a trailer hey a teaser sounds interesting but i cannot say any more okay okay that's very mysterious there you sound like bray wyatt for a second well, maybe it'll just end at the trailer and nothing will happen from it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, yeah, definitely make sure you check that out. Obviously, links to Smack Talk's channel in the description box below. Uh, from me, if you like the sound of Austin versus Brock, then why not check out the video that I made? Uh, it is a, a almost a preview of the match, and I give my live commentary over it. So, yeah, I think it's a pretty awesome match. We scripted it out, me and my brother, so... Hopefully it goes down well and you guys will enjoy that. And obviously, Saturday Night Main Event, um, there's been a, a few mysterious promos coming out at the moment. So uh, make sure you check those and then obviously watch Main Event tonight as well. So lots of stuff going on and it's all exciting. And yeah, make sure you check it all out. So I guess all that's left to be said from us for another We Talk Weekend is... Uh, do you want to catch us later, Paul? Catch you later. Yes, you will. This is Delzinski and Smack Talks signing out. Hi, wrestling fans and gamers. Velvet Sky here, and I just want to say I've been hearing a rumor that Delzinski.com is the best place for video gaming and wrestling content. Now, if you're a wrestling fan and a hardcore gamer like myself, then I suggest you check out Delzinski.com. You will not be disappointed. Holler!